Praise the Lord, everybody. Will you clap your hands and celebrate our Savior? For some of you out there, it has been a while, but we're working on it, and you're going to be here soon. So we're looking forward to having you here uh, with social distancing, but we're looking forward to having you here back at home. So, and I hear the excitement is out there. 
uh, that we are coming back. So we're looking forward to that. And we're just so glad, so glad to say. But I don't know about you. I didn't have a real bad week, but I just say it was challenging. But God is so good. Was he good to you this week? Was he good to you this week? Do you know what he did for you? If he did something good for you, just, just raise your hand. I know he did something good for me. We're going to uh, get started in a second, but we just wanted to, again, welcome you here to the, another virtual uh, worship hour here at Southeast Church. And uh, we, we're going to start out with a word of prayer. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for the sunshine, the warmth, for keeping us safe. Lord, we're in a world where a lot of changes is going on. But no matter what, we know that you are still in control. Yes, sir. That no matter what, how, th how things are going, no matter what COVID-19 does, no matter how Black Lives Matter happens, what goes on there, we know that you sit high and look low and you're taking care of your world, your children, your people. And we thank you. Lord, we ask that you just be with us here in this house. Bless us with your presence. Hide, hide our pastor behind the cross so he can give the words that you would want him to give. We thank you for another Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. amen.
For who you are, you are good, what the song says. My, oh my, he is just good all the time. We just praise you, Lord. Yes, God. Because what you do. Yes, God. Oh, my goodness. Have mercy. <laughs> I am Elder Barry Brooks, and we are going to have our intercessory accessory prayer you know we've just had such a great time just right now in the last few minutes man it's just been wonderful it just I don't know what to say but I do know to say that God has been so good to us you see if you can if you can sit in front of that TV that, that the, the computer your phone you made it another week you made it. And that's only through the Spirit of God. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just again want to thank you for taking us through another tumultuous week. Lord, it's, it's, it's been tough. For some of us, it's been really, really tough. But Lord, we know that we can depend on you. That no matter what we go through, you see, you've walked every step of the way. Matter of fact, you've picked us up and you've walked. Even when we didn't even realize you had picked us up to take us through the situations that we had to go through. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for just loving us even when we're at our weakest. But you loved us anyway. Lord, bless us. Lord, some need financial help. Some of us need spiritual help. Some of us need health, health issues, blessings. But whatever it is that we need, we know that you have already taken care of it. We just appreciate you, Lord. We bless your name. And we ask that you just continue to love us, to help us, to lead us and guide us. Lord, as we worship you today, yes, God. as we give you all of our attention, Lord, we ask that you just show us, teach us, so we can get ready for that great day. Lord, you know what we've been through and what we're going to go through. But Lord, we just ask that you strengthen us. Give us strength. And again, Lord, we just want to let you know that we love you. Lord, bless those who are listening. Bless those who are watching on, on their TVs or their computers. It's a different time. It's a new normal. But there's nothing new to you. There's nothing that you haven't seen, haven't done. Lord, you know exactly what we need, and you know exactly how to take us through this. Bless each family that is listening. Bless those who have come here in this house. Bless these musicians who have done such a wonderful job to lift up here people's spirits, just to give your name. Lord, again, we just lean on you for all things we thank you lord in jesus name amen and amen Which art in heaven hallowed be thy name, 
Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. to take this journey with us. I have a prayer request of the Lord. You mind if I share it with you? That when we all come back together and we are comfortable and we have, as we always do, defeat the virus that is in front of us, that we'll have a baptism, a joint baptism, one that is taking place in Southeast, one that's taking place in Tennessee, in Alabama, in New York, in New Jersey, in Virginia, in Kenya, 
and, and in Ghana at the same time. Since we have learned how to use our technology now, we can just switch from screen to screen. We can go from me to the pastor down there, to the one on the other side of the world, and we just can rejoice in the Lord together. Because I know that my Redeemer liveth, and it's all about Him. It's not about any of us. Anything that you have attributed to Southeast or you have attributed to me is nothing but the Lord moving on your heart. And I tell you, I, I agree with Elder Brooks. It's just a little while. In a little while, we'll all be able to sing together in this place. In just a little while. But when we do, we're not going to stop streaming because then we would cut off our new family. We've already had someone join the church in Denver, Colorado. Uh, online. Amen. Keep asking me, Pastor, I need the address because if I'm going to be a member, I have to faithfully return my tithe and my offering. And I believe that God does not cause every problem, but he can use every issue for his glory. Well, today we start a new series called Kingdom Theology. And in that series, we are going to... Uh, Prepare to return to the church. Next month, we're talking about uh, the gift, the gift of you. But this month, we're talking about kingdom theology. We're going to end um, this whole thing with, with some stuff that is going to blow your mind. But we're getting started today with kingdom purpose, with kingdom purpose. And I, I don't want to play games with you. I don't want to deceive you. I don't want to trick you. Uh, the whole purpose of all of this is to return you to the day that God saved your soul. Somewhere along the way, our lights went out and we began to look around and see all that's wrong. But all those things that were good on the day that God redeemed you are still good. The issue is just that we allow life to distract us. There'll always be challenges. There'll always be problems. But God will always pull you out of every situation, no matter what it is. So I'm excited today uh, to talk about that. Uh, but before I do it, I just want to uh, ask you to have a moment of silence with me uh, as we remember uh, one of my favorite preachers ever. Uh, and that is... Uh, uh, Elder Walter Pearson. Uh, you should be seeing it on your screen now. Uh, yeah, it's, it's on. It's on. Yeah, there, there we are. It should be on your screen now. Um, right when I was beginning ministry, uh, this man was hitting his peak. And uh, he was a fresh of breath air for me because I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, where E.E. Where e. Cleveland and people of that nature, uh, they, they were the voice of black Adventism. Uh, uh, Henry Wright carries on that, that legacy as long as we, we are privileged to have him. And there are many others, and, and they shaped our view of Christianity. And then comes someone who had the answer to uh, the idea of scaring people into the church. Can y'all be real with me just for a second? To, to making you think you're going straight to hell if you don't join the church today, the answer to that is Elder Walter Pearson, Jr. And so um, many things that, are, that I believe in, uh, uh, such as uh, the style of C.D. Brooks just updated, that's Walter Pearson, Many things that I believe in how the gospel ought to be communicated came from this man. And so uh, we joined the rest of the Christian world, not just Adventists, uh, just giving our condolences to the family and celebrating his life. Uh, the good thing about when you give God your life, what you build does not die with you. What he built, the style, the approach the enthusiasm about the gospel. It lives in me. It lives in many people who uh, studied under him, those who attended Oakwood, who graduated in, uh, in theology, and they carry on that legacy. So that's the way God does things. And so just wanted to have a moment 
for us to remember that a great warrior is asleep. And uh, one day Jesus is going to come and get us all. He's going to come get your mama and my grandfather and all of us will be able to rejoice together. But until then, tears are appropriate. Uh, grieving is appropriate. Fond memories are appropriate. So we love, love Elder Pearson. I can't talk to him because he can't hear me. But I'm telling you that I really love this man and the way that he shared the gospel. All right, so we're going to move on now. This thing is not, uh, let me try it again. All right. Here we go. Uh, let's let it connect. Yes, we're going to go on to our scripture. If you can stand with me wherever you are. If you're at home, you've been sitting down all morning. We didn't even ask you to get dressed. You can, you can stand a little bit unless you got some health issues. If you got health issues, sit up. Tell you, tell your aid to help you sit up for the word of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for all that you do and have done for us. Now, Lord, we pray that you enter this room with power, not just here, but send your sweet spirit to every household that is watching at this moment, whether it is in real time or they watch the replay later. We pray, Lord, that you dispatch angels that excel in, in strength and might to hold back the enemy so your children can hear your voice. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, so we have some issues, y'all. We have some issues. And while I work out my issues, I told you last week, I probably got PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress. I probably have ADHD. I'm pretty sure I got ADHD. Uh, I, I got whatever that thing is that make you hungry right after you get done eating. I got that too. Uh, I got a sweet tooth. I got, I got all kind of issues. So don't think when I preach, I'm just coming for you. I am coming for you. Don't get it twisted. But I'm not just coming for you. I'm also allowing the Lord to come for me. The sermon really is built out of whatever wrestling God and I have done on whatever night. The, the, the result of God and I wrestling is a sermon that I am like a, a little refugee, a little, a little foster kid. If, if I get beat up, you got to get beat up too. If, if God going to deal with me, he's also going to deal with you. And I believe that's his purpose. What do you think? So, so here's the issue today. We have to understand the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of men. Many of us are disappointed in the kingdom of God because we've gotten the rules and the doctrine and the principles mixed up with the kingdom of men. Lord, have me, let me show you the difference. In, in the kingdom of men, there is a democracy. So men vote on morality. They vote on what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad. And men's kingdom in the democracy says that as long as you don't make me uncomfortable, you do whatever you want to do. And as long as I don't make you uncomfortable, I do whatever I want to do. However, when you are born again, when you come into the body of Christ, you have left the kingdom of men and now you are in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. God doesn't have an election process to replace the leader every four years. The kingdom of God has the ancient of days, our eternal father, our creator, our provider, and he doesn't ask us what the rules are. Uh, it's quiet up in here already. I just got started, Barry. They're already falling back on me. He doesn't ask us what the rules are. In fact, 
In kingdom theology, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the Lord thought it not robbery to breathe into dust and create a man and give him a kingdom that was created for his benefit. Mm. On those seven days of creation, everything God put into place was to hand it over to man. But there are kingdom rules that conflict with worldly rules. And so I figured y'all wasn't going to trust me. So I brought a few dead people with me. You want to hear what they got to say? He is John Calvin. Uh, John Calvin says the church is the gathering of God's children where they can be helped and fed like babies and then guided by her motherly care. Grow up to manhood in maturity of faith. Now, what is John Calvin saying here? God accepts you where you are, but when he blesses you, he expects you to grow. Lord, have mercy. All right, well, well let me find me another. I'm going way back now. Clement of Alexandria says, Just as God's will is creation and is called the world, so his intention is the salvation of men. And it is called the church. I think we need to digest that. It's too early in the morning to read it once. Let me read it one more time. Just as God's will is creation and is called the world, so is or equal to is his intention is the salvation of men. And it is called the church. All right. That's Clement of Alexandria. Let's go to somebody who may still be alive. All right. <laughs> Chuck Colson owes it to us. Uh, let me give you an illustration. What if, I, what if I came to you, Jan, and I said, I'm going, just give me your routing number. I'm going to give you $50 a day. Every day, without fail, I'm going to deposit $50 into your account. Now, what would happen? What would happen, right? In the beginning, Jan would want to tell everybody about this crazy man who don't even know me, didn't ask me for nothing. He gave me $50. And he, every day I wake up, there's a deposit of $50 a day. And Jan would be, oh, that is wonderful. I love him. I don't know him, but I love him. Right? He's, he's, he's altogether lovely. He's wonderful. He's a good man. Now, look. Come here, boys. Look at here. Look at here. Look at that man. $50 a day. That's the kind of man I want you to be. That's what she would tell her students, right? I need you to come up on higher ground. She'd probably be interview her for TV. She'd say, I need all you men out there to come up on higher ground because I know a man that gives me $50 a day and don't ask me for nothing. All you have to do is enjoy it. And, and so what would happen, Jan would start out fantastic. And then a couple of months down the road, her bills would be $50 a day. <laughs> and then she'd be wondering why has this plague this trouble come upon me all I got is $50 a day and then, then she'd find out that I made the same deal with somebody else for $100 a day Oh, now it's about to really get rough up in here Jan is taking her earrings off she put them in her purse she don't have earrings on <laughs> Uh, she, she, she putting a, je a, a sweatpants on them fighting sweatpants. You only fight in those. And, and she wants to find out who he giving this $100 a day. Well, that wasn't the deal. The deal was I would give you 50 a day, and all you have to do is appreciate it. Why does it change when you find out I'm giving somebody else 100 Do you see what I'm saying? Now, let me, let me blow your mind for a minute. I've done the research, and as of January of 2018, right above Above the poverty level, guess how much it costs to take care of the average person in America? $50 a day. I'm going to make somebody thank their husband today. I'm going to make somebody thank their wife today. and Because uh, most of y'all are not living at poverty level. At poverty level, it takes about $50 a day to take care of every American. Yet you have people walking around here talking about God is not real. The church ain't no good. And, good and, and I don't know why I got to go through this and why I got to go through that. Uh, look, let, let me tell you something. To whom much is given, much is required. You see, the thing is, 
things that, that God is already providing for all of us. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden. I'm still preaching. I never left my message. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden. He gave Adam, he says, you have dominion, you and Eve, over everything that you see. I'm going to give it to you every day. My mercies are new every morning. First of all, I'm going to watch over you while you sleep. I'm going to wake you up in the morning in your right mind. I'm going to give you the ability to explore, to build, to, to, to produce, to plant, to water, to do whatever you want to do. All you got to do is just appreciate it. And, and so we, we, we say, so, oh, Adam, boy, Adam was stupid. Now, now, now let's take a look at our own situation. Oh, I better leave that. Let me go on to the next one. Let me explain it through nature. I'm going to get off you. These are laws of nature that God put in place. God built the kingdom, and he gave the kingdom a purpose of being built. That's what all my little illustrations are about. For instance, here is a law. It creates relationships. For instance, God created the fish without the fish asking. All the fish have to do is honor its relationship with the water. The fish is taken care of as long as it respects the law that it has. It is a co-laborer with the water. It cannot survive without the water. The minute that the fish decides, I want to live outside the water, is God evil or is the fish dumb? Uh, did nobody want to talk to Pastor Hood today. Yes, sir. Is the problem God or is the problem the fish? Right, right. It must honor. Now, God's not going to make the fish stay in the water. Is that right? But however, the law will kick in when the fish comes out of the water. I'm going somewhere with this one, right? Right. So same thing with plants, right? Plants will grow as long as their roots are planted into the ground. Now, there are things that plants need that they cannot provide for themselves. They cannot provide sunlight. They cannot provide rain. They cannot produce what they cannot. They do not have uh, organically what they need, which is oxygen, water, sunlight, soil. They need those things. Humans have a relationship with plants, soil, oil, uh, air, and water. Humans have this relationship where we are co-laborers with it. And if we honor that relationship, we'll be, health we'll be healthy and God will bless us. But if we dishonor that relationship, for, for, instance, for instance, that carbon monoxide that we breathe out and that oxygen that they give back, we need those things. But if I roll the plant up and light it with a cigarette lighter and inhale it, oh, you better cut it out. Pastor Hood, my whole street smell like weed right now. You better stop, Pastor Hood. If I fail to honor the relationship, is it God's fault? Or is it my fault, you crazy people? God said, eat it. You won't eat it. You want to smoke it. God said, don't smoke it, but you want it. Y'all just, man, let me move on. Let me go on with some man-made. And we talk about kingdom purpose today, and I, I want to preach, but I got to set it up. I got to set it up. All right, so, so your car is fearfully and wonderfully made. You saw the commercial. doesn't matter which one it is. It, they, they, they'll make a car that don't cost but $5,000 sound like it costs $500,000. By the time they finish with the commercial, it is fearfully and uniquely and wonderfully made. But it is designed to run on gasoline or battery, whatever it is that you have now. You cannot go to your water hose and stick it into your tank and say, this is cheaper. I know it was designed to run on gasoline, but I like water. You can't tell me it's my car. I bought it. You know how y'all do your neck. I can't roll my neck, but I can roll me. You can, I bought my car. Ain't nobody going to come up in here and tell me how my car supposed to work. Well, you go on, put the water hose in there then. You stick the water hose and you can feel the car will not resist, will it? It will allow you to fill the tank up 22 gallons of water. Close, put the cap back on it. Put it on tight now. <laughs> Go get in the driver's seat. 
And let me tell you how crazy people are. Yeah, got the seatbelt on, Jan. Thank you, Jan. And, and, and then we'll sit there before they crank it up and say, now, Lord, you know. <laughs> you gave me this car. And I know you didn't give it to me not to work. <laughs> You're disobeying, disobeying kingdom law, but expecting kingdom blessing. Uh, uh, that's all I'm trying to tell you. It, when, when God comes into your life, and, and, and I, I apologize. I couldn't find the Jesus that looked like me. They won't paint him. Maybe I got to paint him myself. But, but, but Jesus is talking to you now. And he, he has you all by yourself in quarantine. He's telling you that I created you unique. You know that you are blessed. Why is it that you curse me with your behavior? Why is it that you act like I'm not doing what I'm doing for you? Why you want to test me? God wants to deliver some of you today from gambling. That's right. Some of y'all are hopeless gamblers. What do you mean by gambler? You know what's right, but you refuse to do it hoping that it turns out okay. And God is trying to deliver you today from the foolishness of ignoring the manufacturer. Who is the manufacturer? He is the king of glory. He is the great I am. Universes can't describe him. We keep looking out trying to find new stars and there's more than we ever can find. Every time you look around there's something new to learn about God and we ain't nowhere close to understanding who he is so how dare we tell him how to handle his creation the, when they asked Jesus how to pray he said thine is the kingdom thine is the power thine is the glory and then we walk away and say ain't nobody at church ain't gonna tell me what to do we fight the church because we're scared of God. Can I tell the truth? You really mean God, but church is reachable. It's tangible. It's accessible. But what is the church really teaching? It's teaching the word of God. Uh, I'm going to give you some words from God. You want some kingdom law that conflicts with man's law. Kingdom law says don't cut yourself. Uh-oh. By cutting, I mean tattooing. Mm-hmm. It, it's, boy, it's so quiet in here. Didn't nobody say amen but the road. You say, amen. <laughs> Kingdom law says don't cut yourself. And man says, I'm just picking it because it's controversial. And man says, but I don't understand. Kingdom law does not require, require you to understand. It does not require me to understand. It only requires me to Obey. Just like that fish, you jump out the water and say, I can breathe. We go back into the water. But you stay outside that water. And see, some of us been outside the water. We've been outside of the water, and that's how God got us back. I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but we tried it. We tried it, and we found out that there's nothing better than God. Let me get back to the Bible. Isaiah 43, verses 10 through 12 says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, kingdom, purpose, kingdom, purpose. What's your purpose? to be a light to the Gentiles, to walk in righteousness, to hold on to God's hand. He is given us, in other words, we are set aside as a symbol of him. If people want to know what God is like, they should have to look no further than what we're like. Mercy. Mercy, Jesus. Help us. We might need to pause and repent right now. We're going on. It says, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Now, there are many ways to do these things. The issue is we are mandated to do it. Did I say mandated? Yes, we are mandated. First thing to do is what I'm standing up here doing now, to open 
blind eyes. That means we are to share the good news that there's a better way than the world's way. The second way to bring out prisoners, kind of the same thing. It's not just physical prison, but it's all kinds of prison. Isn't that right? To bring people out of darkness where they think right is wrong and wrong is right, up is down and down is up. You got relatives like that. I don't have to explain it to you. Now, let me tell you what happened to us right quick, and then I'm going to preach this on out of here. Is that all right with you? You don't mind a little teaching, do you? Well, you've been sitting at home. Your kids miss school. Here's school for you right here. Here's a little teaching for you. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened to us in about 120 seconds. Can I do it? You think I can do it? And prehistoric times, we had to live in nature. We had to. It was not an option. But so by living in nature, we saw the glory of God naturally. When the saber-toothed tiger didn't bite us, we said, thank you, Jesus, and ran into the cave. And then inventions brought some convenience to light. In other words, somebody came up with a wheel, and the saber coup tire not only couldn't bite us, he couldn't catch us. We were burning rubber. It was Fred, Fred Flintstone, Barney Rubble time. We were flying through the desert, flying through the woods, because we figured out how to make a wheel. It was on when we made that wheel. Can you say amen? And then we, we decided to start to come in, come in from vast farms and come closer and build communities. This is called the old age. When we began to build community, we started to develop uh, these systems of relationship to one another. In the beginning, it was us against nature and nature giving back to us. And then it became, don't look at nature, let's look at what your neighbor has. Oh, I'm preaching this thing up in here. Then we get to the Middle Ages, and it turned into, let's take what your neighbor has. Lord, have mercy. So when you start taking what people have, fear makes us get closer together. In order to protect what we have, we got to live tight up on each other. So somebody can ring the bell, sound the alarm when barbarians come to take what we have. And during that time, people figured out all kinds of weapons of war to take things from each other more efficiently. And the way that they did it is by diversion, right? So they had to identify a group. It's the Jews that's causing the problem. It's the black people that's causing the problem. It's the Indians that's causing the problem. It's the, wait a minute, did I run out of people yet? Well, I'm going to move on. But it's, it's, it's the people from next door. It's the people from down the street. But all it really was is that kings created kingdoms through fear. the Middle Ages, and then we come uh, into the modern age where we realize that taking from each other is not sufficient, it's not sustainable. We can't take from each other through bloodshed, so we got to trick each other into giving it to us. This is how you got the Catholic Church, right? It's an amalgamation of all kinds of systems that trick people into obeying, right? And so after that, you have the French Revolution. Are we walking through history now? You have the French Revolution, and what happens with that is they figured out that we've been tricked, so they kill all the people in charge. And when they kill that, they kill the church. Am I talking to you? What they decide is, post-French Revolution is, I will only believe what I can prove. Because these people told me that God said it, and I can read now, and I found out that God didn't say any of that stuff. So I'm going to get rid of you and God, and I'm going to invent things where I don't need you, and I don't need God. So you have an industrial revolution. Y'all don't mind me talking like this. I'm almost done with it. You have an industrial revolution to make it easier to live together. So now where, where the clock didn't matter because you worked on your farm and produced your crops and did your labor of love, now time is important. And then they created that thing called Sears and Roebuck. Lord, it was a straight out of the pits of the kingdom of the devil. That Sears catalog changed everything. 
They built railroad tracks and 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 the downtown is created because of that Sears catalog. Y'all better check me out. Sears catalog. So so what the, the mama usually had three dresses. She had her old dress that she worked in. She had her everyday dress that she walked around when she got cleaned up, and she had her church dress. And when the church dress got old, it became the everyday dress, and the everyday dress became the work dress. But that doggone Sears catalog. She looked in there and saw all kind of china and all kind of dresses and all kind of furniture. And she said, working on this farm ain't going to do this. $50 a day is not enough. Come on, man. You need to go downtown and get a job. Because I would already ordered this stuff out of this catalog and it'll be here tomorrow. So you got to go get a job. <laughs> So you create cities, and these inner cities become kingdoms unto themselves. So instead of having our hands in the soil and looking up to the sky and thanking God every night when you see the stars, now all you see is the top of buildings and smog and pollution and, and, and chemical trails. and Oh, stop it, Pastor Hood. And you see cell phone tiles and corporation emblems. And so you begin to think that this is how it is. We don't need God. Don't you understand this is how Sodom and Gomorrah was built? They went off to themselves and thought they were self-sufficient, but all they were were the biggest beneficiaries of grace and mercy. Like the prodigal son, God allowed Sodom to live out its foolishness until he couldn't take it anymore. And the Bible tells me that in the last days, men will turn their hearts away from God and from their children and from their parents. And they will begin to mock him and say, where is this promised savior? Because they're so stupid. They can't look and see that this has been tried again and again and again. And the end result is, oh, none of this can save me. I got to get back to God. So what am I doing here? What am I doing with Southeast? I'm, I'm going to tell you straight up. I came to bring the glory back to the house of the Lord. I came to pray up the Shekinah fire. I, I, I want to see the glory of God in this. I want people to come in every week broken, believe healed. I want people to come in sad, believe shouting. I want people to know that not only is God real, but he's here in the house. That's what we're looking for. God says, if you build it, I will come. It wasn't Kevin Cosner. It was God. They ripped him off. He said, if you build me a tabernacle, I will dwell among my people. How arrogant is it to think that because we put satellites up in the sky, we keep the sun and moon in place? How arrogant is it to think because I built shelter, I'm safe? It's never worked and it never will. Does God want you to have nice things? Yes. Does he want you to enjoy yourself? Yep. But he never wants you to forget kingdom theology. Kingdom rules work like this. If I don't want to get shot at 4 o'clock in the morning, be in the bed at 4 o'clock in the morning. Now, there's still a small percentage that somebody might shoot you, but it's highly unlikely. Ah, kingdom theology. Let me go on to my scripture. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, and, and we're going to leave now. For we are his workmanship. In other words, God put intentionality into you and into me. God didn't just throw out a bunch of stuff and it became people. No, he carefully designed each and every one of us. And the reason that we are so unhappy and so uncomfortable is because we are not honoring the rules of your craftsmanship. You are not doing what he created you to do. And if you are doing it, you're not doing it in a fearless way. When we stop worrying about what people think, and start honoring what God thinks, then we will become whole and complete. That's the deal. You think I'm competing with pastors? 
Oh, I care what they think to a certain extent. But in the end, they ain't putting me here and they can't take me away from here. For God I live, you know the rest of it. For God I die, that's the way you got to live. And somebody come tell me, well, man, uh, Pastor so-and-so is showing out. I say, amen. Amen. Because I'm living in my workmanship. I'm working out what he created me to be so I don't have to be insecure about what somebody else is doing. Uh, let me add one more thing to it while I'm at it before I go. I ain't got to explain to you why I am the way that I am. Somebody's being blessed, somebody's being saved, somebody being delivered. So all praise be to God. Let's work this thing out. So, so we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. You see that? Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in. He expects fruit from you and fruit from me. Ah, right, time to bring this thing on closer to the end now, Barry. We're going on to that wheel. You see that wheel up there, guys? Uh, uh, when a person comes into the church, I feel like this is the presidential address, right? When they come into the church, they are new or untaught or returning. And we're supposed to establish a foundation with them when they are new, untaught, or returning. The problem with the church today, and I'm not just talking about mine, I'm talking about everybody church, is you can't establish anything because you can't tell what the church believes or what it stands for. You walk into it and you run into any and everything. You don't know what the rules are because nobody is following them. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you ain't got to go there, Pastor. Well, if it was your house, you would. If we came to your house and you say, I want everybody to take your shoes off. I got footies at the door. You ain't taking my shoes off. I'm going to walk out. What you think? Well, that's just one person. Think about 200 of them up in here talking about what they ain't going to do. Boy, y'all better pray for me. <laughs> you better pray for me. Man, look. We must establish, do you see in the green there? Established in foundations. What are the foundations? That's the problem. We got different opinions about what the foundations are. Lord have mercy. What are the foundations? Okay, well, let me share them with you real quick. If you love the Lord, you won't have no problem with nothing he say. We don't have to argue about nothing if you love the Lord. Now, the problem is people in power add their stuff to it, right? And people who are supposed to be trained and established, they want to go from just walked in to running something. Oh, man, look ahead. Look, this might be my last sermon up in here today. They might take a vote this evening <laughs> to get rid of him. But it's the truth, isn't it? The folk coming in, you can't tell them nothing. And the folks who are already there, you can't tell them nothing either. This is why we need kingdom theology instead of man's theology. It takes people's opinion out of it, and you deal with the scripture and the foundation of the word of God. Mature Christians don't stalk people and troll people over things that have nothing to do with salvation. Mm hmm That's right. And that, that's what the problem is. And I didn't hit something there. That, that we, right up, we up in there now. I don't know what time it is. But I take your time. Pass somebody on a respirator. I have to preach. I have to preach. <laughs> Mature Christians don't stalk and harass people about stuff that has nothing to do with salvation. Because mature Christians are working within their craftsmanship. In other words, I'm so busy upgrading my house that I don't have time to kick over your house. There's so much stuff that God has to do in me. I don't have time to be stalking you about things that don't mean nothing. In the end, they have no eternal value whatsoever. Yet, we want to stalk people when we're insecure and immature. And instead of people being birthed into the kingdom whole, they're birthed lame and broken. So then it becomes impossible to disciple them because they've already been destroyed. They can never become a mature Christian if they never saw one. 
Lord, have mercy, hood. Get off this and let us go. The purpose of the kingdom is to, if when people see us, they should have answers about what God is. So we go from becoming mature to serving the church and reaching the unsaved. If the only job you have in the church happens between 9 and 1 p.m., you don't have a ministry. Let me say it one more time. If the only jobs you have in the church only happen while church is happening, you don't have a ministry. You found a way to keep from having church. Uh, let me talk to the plant. So let me tell you something, plant. If the only job you got is to sit there, you don't, have, <laughs> you don't have a ministry. Come on, let's be real. Uh, it's, it, yes, the church has to be run. It has to operate. But if you're never still and in worship, you're not in the church. You just work for it. You to help. Right. Lord, have mercy. Somebody else can take the mother's room next week. You ain't got to have it every week. That ain't somebody doing and just be faking. I don't know why they got me down here again because you want to be down there. If you really were a worshiper, you would start out in the mother's room. But as soon as the pastor start preaching, you'll be leaning. Before you know it, you're in the sanctuary like this. you blaming the church like you're a slave. That's what you want to be. So we bring in new believers. Not because we had a program, not because we spent $20,000, but because we became what God created us to be. And when you become what God creates you to be, you don't have to find new members. New members find you. I wish I had a witness up in here. You don't have to, you don't have to clarify who you are. They know who you are. Mm-hmm. Y'all got to stop being scared. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So let me, fin let me finish. Lord, have what time? Ooh, Lord, we've been in here a minute. Okay, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, the perfecting of the saints. All right, so we got to take some things out of our vocabulary. I may not be what I supposed to be, but I'm so glad I'm not what I used to be. That worked like three times. And after that, your own relatives don't want to hear it no more. They want you to do better now. <laughs> right? All right, so the perfecting of the saints is you are a constant work of God. I am a constant work of God for the work of the ministry. You have a responsibility to do ministry. Churches now all over the world have the leader and whoever they can catch before they get in their car. No matter what the ministry is, it's the leader and whoever will pick up the phone, whoever will answer the text. They got a committee voted in of a thousand people, but it's the leader and them faithful one or two or whoever they can catch. They don't even try to look at you. They be getting to the door where they're trying to get on up out of the church because they know what you want because they don't want to do ministry. All of us, every Christian has a responsibility to do ministry. Let me prove it to you. I promise, I promise I'm going to come to a close. Let me prove it to you. There, about 30 years ago, about 30 years ago, you could walk into any of our churches and you would know you were in an Adventist church. All right, you could be down at the hospital. And uh, well, what church you go to? Oh, I'm saved, saved, five blessed. My pastor is Reverend Dr. Stan J. Hood. And you know exactly what church that is. You know what denomination is because all of them talk that way. Right? You know, you know that is a Baptist, a Baptist, and then, then you ask somebody to pray, and then if they want to sing three songs first, and the prayer going to be 20 minutes, you know it's a holiness, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you might get two or three prophecies before the prayer is over with, and I ain't mad, I'm just trying to say, not too long ago, we knew who we were, and we were not ashamed. Now we hide until we get ready to go to church. Problem with it is you're supposed to be the church. Mercy. I just keep on starting stuff. Verse 14. 
that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. In other words, we can't stay distracted. We have to be focused. We have to ask God to deliver us from caring what the unsaved people think. I mean, if you really want to break it down to what's wrong with church in America, we care too much about what people think. I just want to pause right here and remind you that you're still getting the $50 a day, even though you're not witnessing, even though you're not bringing in souls, even though you're not following kingdom rules. He still makes the sun come up in the morning, the moon is still out at night. Terror did not come to your door. Lord, have mercy. People are plotting. Spirits are plotting all the time. And God is holding it back through it all. Verse 15 of Ephesians 4. But speaking the truth in love. Here we go may grow up in him in all things. I want to I I leave you right here there. We're supposed to grow up in him, into him, in all things because he is the head. That's next week's message, Father's Day. He is the head, even Christ. He is the head. He's earned the right, verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. All right, Paul gets a little too complicated sometimes. Let me explain it to you. If we all just do what God say and work together, we'll be all right. That's that whole verse right there. All right, so, so let, me, let me end right here. Come on, brother, let me end right here because uh, I know too much can tax you. I know it can. That's why we've broken it up for the rest of the month. God's intention for you and God's intention for me is to be happy, healthy, wealthy, and whole. He has built into his kingdom everything you need to be healthy, wealthy, happy, and whole. If we are not, we're doing what the fish did. We separated ourselves from the things that he's built into the kingdom to bless us. It's not complicated. I know that I can't go to bed with ice cream and cookies in my mouth. That defies kingdom law, right? But if I do it, I cannot blame God because he built things into my life where I don't have to go to bed with ice cream and cookies in my mouth. What he's built into my life are healthy alternatives that he put into the ground that spring up that are just as satisfying. It's not him, y'all. It's me. It's me. No matter what we're talking about, I use something simple, I use something about me, but you can put whatever you want in the blank about whatever's going on in your life. He built into your life, into your personal life, things in the kingdom that will cause you to prosper. If you don't prosper, it's because you will not accept by faith what he says do. You're not here just to exist and then die. You have a kingdom purpose. You are here to be blessed and be a blessing. The only way you won't be is if you choose not to be. That's the only way you won't be blessed is that you decide I don't want to be blessed. Now, I don't want to leave you hanging on a ledge. Next week, we're going to talk about kingdom men. And I, 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 I'm going to win every woman in the church from sea to shining sea. Because I'm going to dig into the men. Next, I'm going to get into it next week with the men. But today, remember, everyone has a kingdom purpose. I want you to think about this. The Philistines were on one side of the valley. 
The Israelites were on the other side of the valley. They were like the Russians and the Americans. If they go to war, then the whole world will end up in chaos and there's much noise and much conflict and much strife and much stress. And the very God of peace looked past the men on the battlefield and saw a boy in a pasture herding sheep. And he says, ah, his purpose is to take the giant down. You see that? Don't be distracted by the noise. Be committed to the very God of peace who built in purpose in you. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful message we have today. Live in your kingdom purpose. We all must do that. God is soon, Jesus is soon to come. And we have to listen to what he has done for us. What he has a purpose for each and every one of us. And I hope that you will find and continue to have your purpose this coming week. At this time, we're just going to talk a little bit. Um, I know that it's um, with social distancing and all the things that are going on in the world today. Uh, we still need your, we still, first of all, we want to thank you for all those who have went online and for those who come to the church and dropped off your uh, funds to, for the uh, betterment of, uh, of the gospel. And we thank you for that. And we still, you know, lights still have to be paid, air conditioning still has to be paid, all these things have to be done. But we appreciate and, and that you bring your tithe and offering to the church. And if you have a problem getting it here, uh, just leave a, a message here at the church and we will be more than happy to come and pick it up. And at this time, we're going to uh, end, our, end our service. And again, we wanna thank you for coming and coming on to our virtual uh, program here at Southeast. And we look for you next, next, next week. And let's bow our heads at this time. Heavenly Father, we ask you to lead us to our purpose. Let us be able to, uh, able to do and bless someone because you have blessed us. And we thank you. So, Lord, we thank you, and we thank you for the message that you gave today. Lord, we ask that you bless each and every one under the sound of my voice. Those who need you, Lord. Those who listened in to, to get that word to, to be uplifted. So, Lord, and those who we ask that you continue to uh, bless them and to take this word out to others. Again. Thank you, God, for just loving us. Thank you for lifting us up and encouraging us. Thank you for Pastor Hood bringing the word yes, that you wanted us to hear today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Let the church say. church say amen God has spoken let the church